Good morning from DC, uh, wherever you are. Hope everybody is, is safe and well. Uh, I wanna say um, good morning in particular and thank you to the Institute for Data, Democracy and Politics at George Washington University and Professor Stephen Livingston for co-hosting this event uh, with NDI. Uh, as originally conceived, um, George Washington University had planned to host us all in person but we had to move online. So I am grateful to Professor Livingston and his team for their help and flexibility moving forward with this event. Uh, I also want to take a moment to thank my own team, the NDI team. They probably don't want me to do this, but I want to thank them. Uh, in particular, I want to recognize Victoria Wellborn and the Asia team for putting together this event and the documentary on which it is based. Uh, can't list everybody who helped, at NDI, but suffice to say, it truly was a team effort, and I want to thank them. And of course, thank you all out there uh, for joining. Uh, Taiwan is in the news these days, and generally for all the right reasons. Uh, it is garnering well-earned appreciation for the way it has handled the coronavirus on its soil, and the responsible ways it has sought to assist global prevention and response. The situation, of course, is not over yet. As long as the virus exists anywhere, uh, and there remains no vaccine, it continues to be a threat everywhere. Uh, we are only as strong as our weakest link. But Taiwan has done its part, becoming a leading example for the world. And it's done so by utilizing the advantages of its democracy. That is its commitment to openness, transparency, and particularly civic freedom, which provide the space for independent citizen activity. Far from seeing their citizens or facts as a threat, or something to fear. The Taiwan government has empowered citizens and treated them as allies. Indeed, the experience across the globe has shown that civil society is often the best and the most effective messenger, the most efficient service provider during a crisis. So in this case, the important role was played by citizen digital technologists, the so-called civic tech community. They led the way and were key to Taiwan's success to date in mitigating harm from the coronavirus. The effort was led by local groups like GovZero, but supported by government leaders like Digital Minister Audrey Tan, who is with us today. We'll discuss all this in greater detail in just a moment. But even before COVID-19 hit, the civic tech community was already attuned and mobilized to combat another virus that puts not just the island, but all democracies at risk. This virus has spread rapidly in recent years and is unlikely to go away anytime soon. That virus is the scourge of disinformation. Information, facts, and debate are the essential lifeblood of democracy. But as such, it can be weaponized. As you all know, authoritarian actors and spoilers of all kinds, foreign and domestic, are seeking to do just that, utilizing a growing digital toolbox to sow confusion, division, discord, and distrust in democracies worldwide. No, no country is immune to this virus of disinformation. Some countries are being uniquely targeted, often for geopolitical reasons, and some are developing more effective response mechanisms than others. Taiwan is one of those places and potentially offers a model for the rest of us to consider and to emulate. Uh, NDI has worked with Taiwan for several years now on this issue. Most recently, last September, to be exact, as part of the U.S.-Taiwan Global Cooperation and Training Framework, the GCTF. Now, NDI co-hosted a workshop with the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, the American Institute in Taiwan, and Taiwan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, entitled Defending Democracy Through Media Literacy. During that event, we heard from those on the front line of Taiwan's disinformation war as the January 2020 presidential elections approached. We remain so impressed by the work of Taiwan's vibrant civic tech community and frankly so concerned about the potential implication of digital attacks from spoilers across the Taiwan Strait in advance of the election that we decided it would be valuable to capture campaign conditions and share the work of the civic tech community with others around the world. The result is a short documentary film that we produced entitled Canary in a Digital Coal Mine. The documentary is available on NDI's website, ndi.org, 
I hope many of you have already watched it in advance of this event this morning. If you haven't had a chance yet, we strongly encourage you all to do so. Today's event it is only about 12 quick minutes long. And in putting together the documentary, we spoke to citizens, civic technologists, academics, and government officials to gain a better understanding of the realities of, of the disinformation landscape in Taiwan, as well as the tools and tactics Taiwan used to deal with digital foreign influence ahead of the January elections. It features an array of remarkable Taiwan citizens, including two very good friends who are with us here today, patching in from Taipei, and to whom I should say good evening to you all out in Taipei who are watching this. So let me do uh, introductions really quickly of the panelists today, and then we'll start our, our open discussion. First up, uh, Audrey Tang. Um, Audrey has been Digital Minister of Taiwan under President Tsai Ing-wen since 2016. In her role as the Digital Minister, um, Audrey has become a leader in developing more open citizen-centered policy-making processes in Taiwan and helped rethink government culture to be more transparent and inclusive. She really has become a global advocate for digital transparency tools, an apostle of sorts for the transformative democratic potential of civic tech, and in particular, how governments can play an active role in ensuring information integrity online. She has been a true friend of NDI since her days as a civic tech activist out of government, so we are always grateful for the opportunity to speak and learn from her. Uh, Dr. Kitty Chen is the Vice President uh, of the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, TFD. TFD is the only international foundation in Asia dedicated uniquely to promoting and supporting democratic development, and as such has become a critical institution for Asia. As Vice President, Kitty has played a central role in increasing TFD's presence globally, and thus showcasing Taiwan's growing value in the democracy and governance space. We at NDI are excited to expand our partnership with TFD, and we thank Ketty and her team for their great work and their wonderful dedication. And finally, I mentioned uh, Professor Stephen Livingston. Um, Stephen is the founding director of the Institute for Data, Democracy, and Politics at George Washington University. He had served as a senior fellow at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School until last summer. We approached Stephen and his team about collaborating on this, this event due to the important research and work they are doing, bringing together stakeholders across media, government, and civil society to understand and create solutions to the threats posed by malign influence in the digital space. So thank you all for joining us. We will be engaging in a conversation among ourselves at first, and then we will open the Q&A from all of you out there. We will be taking questions through Google Hangouts. So please use the Q&A button uh, on your screen to ask any questions of the panel. I'll get them forward to me on my cell phone, and we will get to them during the second half of the program. So enough of my speaking. This is not about me. This is about the panelists. Let me turn now, first off, if I may, to um, um, the Digital Minister, Audrey Tan. Let me start with you. I understand you have a short presentation explaining the Taiwan situation, Taiwan's response, particularly during this uh, coronavirus moment. So let me turn to you and let me just tell folks that you can watch this live on the screen here, but also at live.pdis.tw. Um, but let me turn it over to you, Audrey, to take us, uh, to take us here. Thank you, Derek, uh, for the introduction, uh, and uh, thank all of you for putting uh, the event together. Um, I think the digital social innovation indeed is one of the, as you mentioned, the main way that a civil society, or as we say here around Taiwan, the social sector, uh, become the powerful force not only at counter disinformation, but also countering the other virus, uh, which is the coronavirus. So I will take five to seven minutes uh, to first uh, outline some of the approaches that the social sector has been supporting this entire um, anti-coronavirus or counter-coronavirus um, practice. So it will be like three very simple <laughs> terms, fast, fair, and fun. So let's first talk about fast. Unlike many other countries, uh, Taiwan started working on counter-virus last year. Most countries started uh, working this year in 2020. 
And this is because the whistleblower, Dr. Li Wenliang uh, at Wuhan, uh, shared um, a piece of um, information uh, on the social media in his private group um, that says that there are seven cases of SARS in the Huanan market. Um, and immediately, the day after that, in the very, very early, early morning, the Taiwan equivalent of Reddit uh, PTT um, has this person, uh, Nomo Repipe, uh, reposting this uh, information from Li Wenliang's um, social network. And at the same hour, Dr. Li Wenliang is being investigated by his hospital of spreading um, possibly rumor, and later he would be disciplined uh, for whistleblowing. But in Taiwan, uh, the opposite happens. Instead of uh, this person, uh, Nomo Repipe, uh, being disciplined in any way, actually the CDC uh, medical officer just saw this uh, from the PTT, decided that this uh, merits response, and then we immediately started treating as if SARS has reoccurred in Wuhan. And so as you can see, the um, effective approach of uh, inspection of flight passenger from Wuhan is implemented the very next day. And so we rely on the social sector with uh, the complete freedom of speech on PTT uh, to serve as kind of a early warning system that without which there's no way for the medical offices in the CDC here uh, to detect such a early outbreak. And so uh, we do so because we hold the freedom of speech of assembly as one of our core values. According to the Civicus Monitor, Taiwan is the only jurisdiction in Asia, and uh, along with New Zealand, one of the only two in Asia Pacific uh, that have a completely open civil society, meaning the minister's words is at best the same uh, weight as a journalist's word, and we never encroach on the press freedom. And so because of this, uh, and thanks to the early whistleblowing of Dr. Li Wenliao, Taiwan today remains open uh, for business, for schools, uh, and so on. And so, and this is not just a one-off event. Um, very quickly, the um, National uh, Command Center for Epidemic Control, the CECC, set up a dedicated line, uh, the uh, line that takes uh, phone calls from pretty much anybody. So we have to field a large number of phone calls every day, but they tip us on all sorts of different um, ideas, all sorts of different social innovations, all sorts of early warning systems. Uh, and every day there's a press conference that is live streamed and we work with the journalist community so that when they ask anything, the um, Minister of Health and Welfare, who is also the CECC commander, answers each and every of the questions and considers the journalism community a partner. So just one example is that there was a one journalist that said there was a uh, small boy that because the uh, medical mask that he received was pink. Uh, and so he uh, thought that um, th he would not be treated uh, right uh, by his peers in school. So he refused to go to school because of the pink medical mask that he received. And so the very next day, everybody in the press conference, all the commanders and vice commanders wore pink medical mask in a way to uh, build this kind of report uh, with the civil society and to put all the uh, ongoing issues uh, into a same fact, matter of fact discussion ground. And so I think the civil society trusts the CECC not to uh, make them disappear as other uh, jurisdictions do. And the CECC trusts the social sector uh, to share relevant information on the uh, 1922 line, uh, the telephone line, as well as online. And so the second principle is fairness. The fairness is uh, evidenced by, for example, that anybody can collect such medical mask. Um, they don't get to choose the color, but otherwise the same uh, medical mask anywhere in a nearby pharmacy. And so we work with the pharmacy so that they publish every three minutes their real-time stock level. So that if you take your national health insurance, which has more than 99.9% uh, percent coverage in Taiwan, to a nearby pharmacy, you can collect mask without any panic buying. Um, and so the civil society, the GovZero uh, community and other people built more than 100 tools in the sense of fairness so that if people with blindness, people with deafness, people who speak different languages, indigenous people and so on, they can all find their respective tools that directs them to a nearby pharmacy to collect the mask. And even the shortcomings of the pharmacies, like the oversupply of certain areas and so on, are also being analyzed by civil society, which then informs our own mass distribution policy. So for example, people correctly pointed out that in Xinzhu or Taipei, the northern municipalities, there are many people who work 
um, so long hours so that by the time they finish off hour, uh, all the pharmacy have been closed. And so based on that feedback, we implemented a convenience store 24 hour pre-order and collection so that you can still um, collect at the convenience store. And actually starting this Wednesday, you can take your same NHI card to the convenience store for the pre-order. So this is about ensuring fairness uh, in all regards. And finally, as I understand, I only have one minute left. Um, this is about our counter disinformation tactic. It's called humor over rumor. And this is because in a time of panic and anxiety, it very quickly turns into outrage if there is no information that are mimetically funny. And so uh, the same person that you saw in the last slide, our premier, our prime minister, uh, notably uh, uh, put out the social media um, campaign that says, um, please do not panic buy the tissue papers. We have plenty in stock uh, because there was a rumor that said they're being woven by the same material as the medical mask. And because we uh, produce so many medical masks, the tissue papers are going to run out soon. Uh, but actually they're produced in a different places and so on. And the subject here is says that we only each have one buttock and so this is like hilariously funny uh, and it went viral <laughs> and then very quickly we found out that the people who push out those rumors are actually themselves resellers of tissue papers and so within like two days uh, the entire rumor died out because it was just so funny and not to mention the CECC spokes dog that translates all the CECC guidelines including as you can see here social distancing cover your mouth when sneezing um, you know, not to put your hands to your mouth and remind you to pay for the pre-order and so on, all using very cute spouse talk that makes people feel uh, not only relaxed but also engaged so that they will share the information. And so for more information, you can read about in Taiwan can help that US, but that is the basic overview of how digital social innovation helps to fight the coronavirus. Thank you, Audrey. That is wonderful. I don't mean to rush you at all. We want to hear as much as we can from you on all of this because it's really remarkable work by the civic tech community, but civil society writ large in Taiwan, as you say, in partnership with, with government. Um, can I ask you, though, just continuing uh, very quickly, were there, were there tools that you used that did not work? Is there anything that you tried that you found just didn't, didn't take that we can learn because oftentimes you learn from failure as much as you do from all the success. Oh, yeah, very much so. For example, when the very uh, first day of the mask map uh, where you can see the real time stock numbers, people very quickly found out that there are pharmacies that instead of taking one NHI card, swipe it, deplete the stock number and hand out the mask, there are certain pharmacies that just collect the NHI cards and give them uh, some labeled numbers and tell them to collect back in the afternoon. And so the stock numbers will be out of sync because it's essentially batch processing it. And that actually put a lot of uh, pressure, not only to the pharmacies, who will get a lot of flurry of costs that says, hey, the mass mask says that you still have mass in stock, what happens to them? Uh, as well as the pharmacies uh, having to say again and again that they really want to uh, change the open data to add a field that says, you know, we only um, hand out those uh, numbers in the morning, but you can only collect in the afternoon. And so this is what we call a data collaborative. This is how we engage all the different stakeholders. So today, all the pharmacies actually have a special function that they can say uh, click close which is by default in Sunday they close on Sundays now but in other days as long as um, they uh, want uh, they can just issue all those numbered papers and then just say close and they, they would just disappear from the open data mask map or they can pre-declare their opening hours and so on. And so a lot of the civic tech community took this multi-stakeholder facilitator role to allow for the pharmacies to file their complaints really to the data quality, to the update uh, policy, to the distribution policy and so on. And that then become useful criticism that we look at every Monday in the uh, premier hosted meeting to change our relationships and our policies vis-a-vis -vis pharmacies. So in this sense, the social sector is playing also a facilitator's role. Right. Keeping that flexibility, that rapid response is critical, a feedback loop on mm -hmm. a regular basis. Mm -hmm. That's the flexibility of an open society. Thank you, Audrey, for that. Let me, let me just ask Ketty um, a few things. I mean, TFD's mission uh, is, is to consolidate um, democracy, to help Taiwan help consolidation of democracy worldwide and, and in Asia. Uh, and obviously, disinformation can impede that. Um, can you give a sense, just in Taiwan, um, 
How much has Taiwan, in your view, been affected by disinformation campaigns? I mean, what kind of disinformation has Taiwan been subject to? And how much has it really affected, in your view, Taiwan's own democracy? Um, I think that disinformation has always been around um, for decades. But then in recent years, um, you see a hype of distribution of disinformation. But um, I, I think uh, Taiwan's uh, vi very vibrant civil society and uh, 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 civic uh, tech community um, have all been coming together trying to uh, combat disinformation, which in turn tarnish the productivity, uh, the trust between people, um, to uh, or or um, uh, space a shrinking space of people who can engage um, in productive conversation. So, um, well, you asked about um, the kind of disinformation um, for uh, from uh, my post at TFD. We really see um, different kinds of dif disinformation through the years. And you see a kind of metamorphosis or transition of, um, for example, in at the end of uh, 2018, we did a research on disinformation that has been cir uh, or circling and distributing through Facebook fan pages. But then civic tech community working with Facebook, working with government, uh, trying to uh, combat this, uh, uh, this, this uh, ep uh, epidemic, um, you see that disinformation transition into, for example, now a lot of um, things on videos, uh, uh, popular YouTubers, and, and um, through videos, uh, disinformation has been uh, distributed. So um, how much has Taiwan been affected? Well, um, through the election, you see from uh, 2018, when we had our local election, leading up to our national election, um, there's a, uh, a dr dramatic increase of uh, disinformation. But at the same time, I would see, I would think that um, Taiwanese citizens um, have been, um, you know, as uh, the NDI documentary mentions, the canary in a digital coal mine, um, have been exposed to disinformation so much that um, I would not say that everyone has immunity to it, but then I think that there is uh, still the kind of alarm within Taiwanese citizens that you read something that is too good to be true, too outlandish, that people really think critically before they would um, pass the information uh, to their colleagues, their friends, or schoolmates. So um, it's this information influences society that's polarized, but at the same time, I think Taiwan has been building up immune, uh, its own immune system to, uh, to the disinformation uh, that's been hitting us. Yeah. I mean, you've been on the front lines of attacks for for decades, so you're used to, I guess, the mainland in particular, uh, China attacking and trying to confuse and create problems for. But do you have a sense that it is um, accelerating? Did you see it accelerate in the recent uh, January um, presidential elections? Do you see it accelerate over coronavirus? Are you seeing it kind of steady state? Do you see it evolving, morphing into something different? It's, um, it's, it's a bit different. Um, as I mentioned, in 2018, when Taiwan has its uh, local election, there's a, there's a kind of disinformation trying to confuse people, uh, create perceptions of uh, one administration or, or one party member uh, to, towards another. But then leading up to, national, to the national election, there is a change of disinformation, of sowing distrust of people, of their elected government officials, a uh, uh, shrinking space for people to discuss and have a productive conversation if they have different ideologies, a uh, shrinking of that space. And then now um, with the pandemic happening, there's another kind of disinformation trying to um, tarnish Taiwan's uh, positive uh, way of dealing with the pandemic to the international community. Mm -hmm. uh, the straight um, through disinformation such as crop screens of uh, Korean zombie movies uh, with the caption saying that this is actually the city of Taipei. Um, so, so things like that, um, that that's been uh, 
uh, changing through times, but uh, we're not really uh, missing, uh, we're, we're not really uh, getting away from the attack from disinformation, even through election, from the pandemic, and probably in the future. Yeah. I imagine, Audrey, you probably have a lot of fun with the zombie clip. You know, if you want to make that fun and <laughs> turn those around. Um, let, me, let me turn to, to Stephen. Um, if you can put this into context, Taiwan's experience in context, um, give a sense of what we can learn. What do we take away from Taiwan's response? What, what can other countries who are facing these threats learn, um, both by what Taiwan has done in response to the elections, as well as the pandemic? Thank you, Derek. And, and again, let me thank you and NDI for the opportunity to participate in this event. The Institute for Data, Democracy and Politics is very happy to do that. And we hope that we can revisit the possibility of actually in-person uh, events at the university in the future. I think that both Kenny and Audrey have begun to answer the question you just put to me, and that is both have emphasized the important role of civil society. And I, I think that for me, that really stands out as the key determinant in how successful any given nation state is at responding to this information. Broadly speaking, uh, there are two broad answers as to uh, what is disinformation? How do we understand it? The tendency is, is for everyone to focus on the technological, which is appropriate. We need to focus on the built-in features of various platforms that promoting, exaggerating, extremist content and offering a platform for those who want to delude and, and um, uh, misdirect attention. So let's not let the platforms off the hook. But I think that it's also important for those of us who study it and think about disinformation to step back and, and offer another point of analysis, and that has to do with politics and, and society. There are uh, key sociological features of a targeted population uh, that determine how susceptible that population is to disinformation, to disinformation. Almost all of these campaigns that we see around the world are for the purpose of, of exaggerating and deepening pre-existing points of, of, uh, of lack of social cohesion or what Robert Putman called social capital. So in this instance, we would look to the robustness of civil society organizations we would look to the level of trust and transparency that's involved in civil society as well as state organizations to the degree to which trust is high and government authoritative government institutions are trusted disinformation is not going to be as effective as it otherwise might be so it's the it's not the prowess of the technology alone but rather the robustness of the institutions found in any given society where government authoritative government institutions for instance um, or at least previously authoritative, authoritative government institutions are suffering from credibility, that opens up a vacuum. And that vacuum is what's filled by disinformation. Uh, if this is true, then we need to spend as much time finding ways of, of not just addressing the technology, but actually strengthening and providing additional support for civil society organizations as well as as uh, uh, making sure that government institutions don't squander the credibility by, by mishandling crises such as the coronavirus. So those are the, the thoughts that most immediately come to mind. Um, this is something that we're looking at at IDDP along with the Social Science Research Council at looking at American institutions through this, this lens. So this is really quite exciting. You see this around the world. The Baltic states tend to have a better track record at addressing disinformation because of the robustness of their open society, the, the credibility of their institutions, and the role of civil society in their response. I think the same is true of Taiwan. Right. And do you feel that, um, I mean, the personal relationships among citizens, you talk about government and government institutions or civic institutions and, and people, but among the citizens themselves, you find in some countries that families to get information from those you trust, who you're closest to. I mean, what is the hierarchy of, of trust if you don't have those institutions necessarily? What are the other um, arenas where you can build at least uh, some resilience to disinformation from your experience, Stephen? Yeah, I think it, it does. This is where the, the role of, of civil society organizations that uh, have a track record 
of offering authoritative information, <clears throat> excuse me, becomes so important. And we need to be clear, what do we mean by a civil society organization? Certainly NGOs, citizens groups, but also the news media. This goes back to what Audrey was saying, that Taiwanese news media is not controlled, it's open. Um, you know, not all news organizations, as I understand it, in Taiwan are held in the same esteem as others, but there are news organizations that are trusted and it's in those instances that you can turn to an authoritative source. It, it may be highly critical of the government in some instances, but if that newspaper is trusted, if it, if it has built into its DNA the logic of if we make a mistake, there's a reputational cost to be paid. That's the key distinction. If the news organization is going to pay a price for getting something wrong, that means it's signaling that it is a trusted news organization. To the contrary, if there are news organizations that pay no price for factually incorrect information, but are instead involved in identity confirmation or in actually, you know, creating greater degrees of anxiety, that's what you want to avoid. So look for places where people are concerned about their reputation, and, and, and that's a good start. Yeah. And do you see, just finally, on uh, Stephen, stay with you, What do you see um, any difference between... Uh, the approach to combat disinformation related, say, to COVID and an election, or is it pretty much the same? And I could even ask Audrey that. Do you see any any differences in the approach to combating these types of disinformation? Is it pretty much standard? Uh, Audrey, do you want to go first? And then I'll... Yeah, Audrey, please. Okay, certainly. So um, the basic principle of transparency and humor over rumor uh, stays the same. Uh, but election is very high stake uh, and the coronavirus situation is ongoing. That is the main difference. And so a lot of the disinformation around the election tries to, um, as Kelly have uh, mentioned, to discredit the entire institution of um, voting itself. So, for example, this was trending, like a lot of people have seen this during the, the election. This was one of the trending disinformation that says the, the CIA, it's always the CIA, made two special invisible ink uh, for ballots. So one uh, for uh, the other presidential candidates uh, magically fades and the other invisible ink magically appears so that whomever you vote, Dr. Tsai always wins. Uh, and so we see that begin trending literally as soon as people start going to vote. Uh, and that is because they really want to undermine the result of the election. And we don't see that sort of a single uh, event-based uh, disinformation during uh, the coronavirus. And the solution, again, is through civil society participation. In this case, YouTubers, who are participatory journalists, right? So because everybody is a capable journalist now if they are allowed to live stream the counting process. And that is what Taiwan, exactly what Taiwan have done. We invite people, in fact, many of the major uh, parties invited people, trained people to live stream the counting process. And once you live stream the counting process from across many parties and by many prominent or soon to be prominent YouTubers, um, there's no doubt about invisible ink one way or another, because then everybody can see for themselves and it's hip. Uh, to just share what you have seen in the counting process. So for this kind of event-based disinformation, it really takes a lot of uh, design before that event to win over the trust on that particular event. But for coronavirus, there's ongoing disinformation that's not uh, narrative uh, based, but rather scam based. We see a lot of scams, like just by sharing this post and leave your personal information, you could get a medical mask for free. Uh, that's phishing. <laughs> Actually, they don't get mask, they get computer virus maybe. Um, and so the way to counter that again is by civil society participation, but that is a more ongoing process. So I think they don't differ that much in the sense of how they spread, but they do differ about uh, the election being premeditated and therefore need a premeditated response and the coronavirus being ongoing and therefore needs an ongoing relationship. Yeah, I would only add to that. First of all, Audrey, I think that by coincidence, that photo of the polling station uh, that you offered, I, I think I was there, as a, as a matter of fact, and I was very impressed by the level of transparency mm -hmm. of the citizens in the back of the room, live streaming, videotaping, the, the count, and, and, and the, the people who were doing the counting holding the ballots up in the air. For yeah, for people to, to film, yes. That's an institution. That's mm -hmm. what I refer to as the 
constitution. It, it is designed not only to decide who the president is going to be, but also it's designed to do so, do it in a way that builds trust in that institution of, of presidential elections. That's so important. I, I would also just simply add to what I heard you say, number one, the difference between an election and the coronavirus is that an election uh, has a set endpoint. Uh, though sometimes here in the United States it doesn't feel that way. It is, it is a stressful period that institutions have to address. They have to be able to stand up to the pressure, but it's over at some point. Where with the coronavirus, this is an ongoing series of stresses on the credibility of institutions, uh, and especially when you have a large complex federal um, system as the United States has, there isn't one answer to how well the institutions are, are working. Some places well and other places not. Um, and, and so it is a, a different kind of stress test on institutions in some way. Great. All right, we're starting to get questions in from folks who are watching. So let me start uh, asking those. Uh, I'll start with one from uh, one of our own staff from our office in Moldova. Uh, about, and I've got a few questions like this about civic education in, as a resilient fa a factor of resilience. How can we, uh, yeah, how can we teach young people to identify misinformation or disinformation? Um, and is, um, let's see, is there any school age education uh, in Taiwan about fake news, about disinformation, or is the government's efforts focused on adults over 18? Is there anything about that, either Ketty or Audrey, in the Taiwan context? Ketty, would you like to say something about this? Uh, yeah, I'll um I'll say a little bit about media literacy, and then I'll give um uh, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give the floor to um, Minister Tang. Mm -hmm. Um, so for um our work at TFD, um we have done two um regional level uh media literacy um uh, uh, programs. And um, within the program, we include uh, Taiwanese NGO and civil uh, civic tech community to trying to um, share their experience on um, how to educate young people about uh, uh, disinformation and think critically. Um, but I think uh, for for Taiwan's case and and for uh, cases of many other countries, um, educating young people is uh, one. Um, I said. Uh, uh, task that we have to engage, but also we all, we have to provide um, um, this kind of media literacy uh, education to some of our more senior folks as well um, uh, within our society. Um, so when when it comes to the younger people, um, how to decipher disinformation is because um, uh, young people is their their world is permeated with information constantly. Um, so. I think uh, in Taiwan, uh, we have, uh, I think Minister Tang and uh, other government agencies have been working with the Ministry of Education to provide curriculums for um, younger people within Taiwan. Yeah, within th this one, in, in case you need some support. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, please go yeah, on. Go <laughs> yeah. yeah, so um, there's different um, parts of uh, media literacy within within the um, uh, ministry, um, so and and it's it's um, categorized in, in, in different um, aspects and different categories. So um, this is some of the um, government institution as Audrey was showing. Um, so the executive yuan under um, the you know the Ministry of Education, um, NCC. So these are some of the institutions that we actually invite. Um, to our GCTF programs and also uh, work, we work, um, collaborate with Taiwan Fact Check Center and also uh, some NGOs that has to do with the welfare of um, adolescents and children. Um, so these are a lot of things, again, as we mentioned at the outset of um, this, this, uh, this program, it's the combination of NGO, civil society, uh, and government institutions that that's providing the kind of um, all around uh, all, all encompassing education to um, the different age groups within Taiwanese society. Mm -hmm. Right. Any further, Audrey? I'm interested. Let me ask then about the the older folks, maybe 60 and above. We did get a question on on that specifically. 
Okay. Um, the suggestion here is that people 60 and above are watching just TV for the most part. I don't know. Maybe that's true. I don't know. Uh, but uh, what kind of solution do you recommend to apply to, to, to folks like that? Mm -hmm. uh, who may be more set in their ways, a little older? I, I don't know. Do you, do you think about targeting older folks as well? Yes. So uh, first of all, uh, I think this is uh, important to stress that uh, we uh, the Mandarin word, so Google Translate isn't quite um, very accurate here <laughs> because uh, this is um, this website is called uh, Meiti Suyang, uh, which we translate as media competence or media competency uh, rather than uh, Meiti Shidu, which would be media literacy. Uh, so um, uh, just fill in competency wherever you see literacy here. And, and we do draw a distinction um, in our uh, primary and middle school media literacy competence teaching plan because uh, people, no matter who they are and where they are in Taiwan, they enjoy broadband as a human right. Even on the top of the Taiwan, the Savia, the, the Yushan Mountain, uh, almost 4,000 meters high, everybody is um, having access to 10 megabits per second at around 16 euros uh, per month uh, for unlimited data connection. And so the result is that everybody is a broadcaster. Everybody is, if they want, a journalist, a media. So instead of talking about literacy, which is treating them as consumers of media, we talk about competence, which is their uh, capability of producers of media. And we weave that into our curriculum starting from the first grade, from when people are seven or eight years old, because they need to understand that they're producers of media when they're sharing live streaming things and so on. And so I think um, as for the people who are more elderly, this resource is very important in trying to find uh, people who speak different uh, regional languages. We have more than 20 national languages uh, and the human um, kind of uh, connections that you can make. For example, the points that you can say, you know, instead of having your um, children and grandchildren uh, correcting you all the time, sometimes with a, a robot dog to help them, you can also contribute and correct them all the time. Uh, and that sometimes uh, get people listening uh, and, and so on. So, so we have a cute uh, spoke stock uh, called Dr. Message. Um, and it's uh, from the leading uh, antivirus company. Uh, and you just add it to your line, which is your end-to-end -end encrypted um, connection channel. It's like WhatsApp. And then it just scans like an antivirus scanner, all the incoming messages, including pictures and videos, and give out the clarifications. And because it's cute and its user experience is quite good, and especially because it counters not only disinformation, but also telephone scam and things like that, the elderly people are much more willing to install this from a leading antivirus company. But that idea, of course, came from the social sector, the civil society, the COFAX project. This stuff is remarkable. And, you know, we, I know you are traveling a lot and Ketty, you're traveling around a lot and we at NDI are working with a number of these civic tech groups in Ukraine and in the Baltics and all around, around the world for a de design for democracy program, things like that. I'm just curious, specifically, Audrey and Ketty, how, how much are you sharing, we got this question in, how much are you working with other countries in sharing this type of creativity? It's remarkable kind of new uh, adaptations and adaption uh, and, and applications um, to different contexts, country contexts. Are you regularly engaged with, with uh, other countries and other civic tech groups? How is that working? So maybe Katie first? Um, yeah, at, um, at TFD, we um, on a regular basis have um, collaborative conferences and information info sharing workshops. Um, uh, we host them in Taipei, and of course, um, we invite our partners and uh, people, our partners' partners, uh, to come to Taiwan. So we could, um, for the most part, we will invite uh, civic tech community within Taiwan to share um, how they use technology to combat disinformation. Um, but we also are wanting to learn from our regional partners of the kind of disinformation they are trying to tackle within their countries so we could um, provide assistance um, or they could um, uh, also teach us the kind of disinformation that perhaps Taiwan would encounter in the future. Um, so um, at least, uh, for example, um, last year, uh, we have several, the, the largest one being uh, GCTF 
and we did that for two years in a row. Uh, Minister Tang being our first keynote speaker um, our, at our GCTF. Um, so uh, we actually are expanding. Um, last year's GCTF, we included uh, European countries as well. Um, so if um, we are able to um, get get over or uh, the pandemic, uh, we are looking to um, expand the program. But at the same time, now we're learning uh, to conduct information or conduct uh, conferences uh, online to share information online via different uh, platforms and applications. And for the past few weeks that I've done it, um, it's it's working quite well as well uh, as well. So. Um, and it's uh, very uh, budget consuming also, uh, uh, not, not very budget consuming. So um, people could kind of just uh, come in uh, to listen. So um, we're actually in the process of trying to reorganize um, under the current circumstances, um, information sharing workshop uh, through uh, the cyberspace. Right. Mm -hmm. that's, that's excellent. Okay. Yeah, I, I would just add uh, in my in my other hat um, as AGF Zero contributor. Uh, sometimes it's it's easier uh, for the um, social sector to build such international connections. I mean, uh, during the GCTF, which is a mini lateral, uh, growing to be not so mini lateral nowadays, uh, with four or more host countries per uh, per GCTF, uh, we share basic concepts like uh, humor over rumor. And we share um, some worked examples, for example, again, the premier uh, saying that we will not find people who perm their hair uh, because he used to have hair and he will not punish people who had hair uh, like he was when he was young. But if you perm your hair many times uh, during a week, uh, maybe your hair will fall off and you will look like him uh, and things like that. So, so it, it also went viral. It's a really good piece of comedy. But obviously, we don't export that sort of uh, mimetic engineering to other jurisdictions, which is show that what work and they have to develop their own comedic teams but if, uh, tools uh, such as Cofax that I refer to that we can uh, introduce uh, through the civil society so this was the initial uh, Cofax uh, website with people who forward any disinformation or rumors to the bots uh, and the bot will collectively build a um, clarification database and so the GovZero community shared with the for example uh, people in the Jurongo University in Thailand, and we helped them to build a workshop with the Jurongo University's uh, Media Communication Arts Department. So by the time that uh, our cross-sectoral team went there to have a full-day workshop, and by the time we go back to Taiwan, suddenly there's cofact.org. So uh, if you were to remove the S uh, from cofact to cofact, you get into the Thai version uh, of cofact, which is pink uh, and beautiful um, and uh, even more humorous as we can see recently on Twitter uh, and they have a different configuration uh, when it comes to social sector, private sector and public sector partnership. Maybe they start first uh, with uh, things around health. Maybe they start not uh, as much as, as in Taiwan about political ideology and so on. So they need their own cross-sectoral collaboration model, but the basic source code that is the underpinning algorithm and so on, that is entirely shared and co-developed with the GovZero community. Mm -hmm. I just asked to follow up very quickly. You mentioned Thailand there. Any specific countries that you've established partnerships with, you feel comfortable in the, in the documentary, we, we show Ukraine and others that are doing similar mm -hmm. type of, but mm -hmm. are, there, are there formal partnerships of the specific countries that you would want to mention here that you're working with? Well, in the GovZero hackathons, uh, regularly, people from um, Korea, from Japan, from Hong Kong, uh, they, they are regulars because we share very similar time zones. Uh, and there's also interests uh, from the GovTech part in Singapore as well. Um, although we understand that Singapore um, has a, a different social configuration, uh, politically speaking, uh, on the source code level, we can still share. And so I think especially around the uh, coronavirus thing, uh, for example, when Tokyo Metropolis worked with co for Japan, which is their uh, equivalent of GovZero, to develop the Stop COVID dashboard, uh, we immediately started translating it into different languages so that nowadays you can just click, for example, the English website and see uh, how things are going in Tokyo. Uh, and because it's open source, uh, means that you can always find a 
octocat, which is here, uh, that points to the source code, you can very quickly then see that there's many other people in many other municipalities uh, just forking, meaning taking it and making a different version. And there's almost 2,000 different versions out there, each taking care of a different need or a municipality. Or even in Taiwan, there's people using the same numbers uh, to help visualizing things and comparing things uh, in a very apple-to-apple, orange-to-orange basis. So I think these are the powerful collaborations that doesn't go through official diplomatic channels, but nevertheless have a real impact on the official channels as well. So when I changed one letter here in the language selector, um, this uh, the, for the Taiwanese version, uh, the um, mayor of Tokyo actually thanked me for it on Twitter. And so it became somewhat diplomatic, but I uh, contributed only through my uh, social sector um, credentials. Uh, let me ask, yeah, go ahead. You want yeah, to I wanted to ask Audrey a, a question. So is that like an Ushahidi event mapping platform that you're using? You're crowdsourcing the, mm -hmm. the data that's coming in and then you're aggregating it and displaying it and using mm -hmm. it as a feedback loop mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to responders. Yeah, that's really very good. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And we do that, uh, or by we, we say the GovZero community, do that uh, for like the mass distribution. Any pharmacy, any visitor to the pharmacy can report what's happening there. Uh, and there's multiple systems that enable this kind of underground real-time feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Derek. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, let me ask um, you a question. Uh, Stephen, much has been written about Russia's disinformation campaign and the recent adaptation uh, in this crisis. How do you think China is learning and adapting? Yeah, I, I think that my colleagues on the panel would, would indicate that there's there is emerging evidence that the PRC is beginning to emulate some of the Russian tactics. Um, and th that is concerning, you know, generally speaking, for the most part, the PRC has been focused on information management control internally, but now it's starting to reach out and I know Taiwan has been an exception to what I'm saying for some time, but but there is a more aggressive, robust effort on the part of the PRC to to especially distract attention from from its responsibility with COVID-19 uh, epidemic. It it is saying it's coming up with alternative narratives, saying I don't know about the CIA, Audrey, but uh, that that others other than what the events in Wuhan. Uh, are responsible for the coronavirus. Uh, so that's the sort of thing that, that we're seeing a lot of now these days. Yeah. Um, question here about encrypted platforms. Um, can you speak to effective methods of countering disinformation spread via encrypted platforms like WhatsApp, specifically WhatsApp. How do you think about that? How do you address that? Yeah, so uh, far as I understand, the line uh, information platform, which is also end-to-end -end encrypted, uh, um, other than the stickers, I don't know about stickers, but other than the stickers, things are end-to-end -end encrypted, even in group chat. Uh, and so things like Dr. Message, like Kofax, and so on, they're just bots. Uh, and bots that could be invited into your group discussions and so on. So this is the same model as um, actually counter spam. Uh, you um, flag things as spam, not by a single state authority telling you to flag spawn, but rather working through spawn um, extensions uh, in your mail reader or through your uh, email providers uh, built in anti spawn measures so that you can flag individual mails. And the uh, social contract is that once you flag something as spawn, you basically donate it into the research community so that they can help finding where the spawns are coming from and block. Uh, incoming spams uh, from your inbox and rather it will land into your junk mail folder which we check only when we have too much time uh, and so the same thing is happening uh, through this end-to-end uh, -end encrypted channel and the bots involved it is not by one single central command it is by multiple vendors of antivirus and so on offering their solutions as chatbots and the platform companies I think need to provide uh, accountability dashboard as of which of, of those partners are acting um, responsibly and who uh, do you contact if you see something wrong with those um, counter spam uh, bots uh, because they can also um, propagate uh, different um, ideologies and so on. And so, for example, the LINE platform do provide such a dashboard telling you how many people uh, are flagging how many messages 
through their uh, fact checking and clarification partners what are now the trending rumors and misinformations and who are they working with and two of these four uh, Michael Penn and uh, the Taiwan Fact Checking Center are also partners in the International Fact Checking Network, so they also enjoy solidarity and technical support from the international community. But it is this transparent dashboard that allows everybody to transparently see that these fact checking and clarification partners are not pushing their own agenda somehow. Well, I think we have time for one last question here. Um, <clears throat> Are there any laws, excuse me, are there any laws in Taiwan that control or against disinformation and fake news? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, in Taiwan, uh, as a legal concept, we do not say the F word. Uh, and especially uh, per speaking personally, because both my parents are journalists, uh, I, I do not say the, the F word, that is to say the, the fake news uh, word. Uh, and the reason <laughs> is that in Taiwan, um, the news, Xing uh, Wen, uh, and journalism, Xing Wen Gong Zuo, are really the same word. Uh, and so uh, journalism is literally news work. And because of that, if we say uh, fake news, uh, we say also uh, fake journalists and alienating journalism is never the good thing to do here. And so in Taiwan, there is a legal definition of uh, disinformation. It is very specific and very narrow. It is intentional, harmful, untruth. And the harm must be to the public not to the minister's image, which is just good journalism. Uh, and so all the existing laws have been uh, upgraded uh, to uh, basically say very specifically that only intentional harmful untruth are countered through uh, legal remedies. And, and that is the extent of, uh, of it. And so, for example, when uh, the people in PTT, as uh, my first very first slide, are sharing that there may be SARS um, outbreak in Wuhan, uh, it may or may not be true, but it is certainly not intentionally harmful. And because of this, this kind of whistleblowing will not be penalized uh, by the legal apparatus. Well, let me just ask one sum up question to all of you. Um, I mean, this is a remarkable story that Taiwan is doing and uh, what it's sharing for the world. It really is uh, spotlighting just how much Taiwan has to offer to the international community. What is your biggest worry in all this? Um, I like the way folks are focusing on the positive, can do, but find a way to make this happen instead of wallowing in concern about, oh, goodness, we're on an under attack. And, you know, digital technologies, we sort of uh, manic depressive about digital technologies 10 years ago. It was going to be, you know, saving us all. More yeah. recently, it's the fount of all evil. And now it's a tool. It's a tool that can be used for good and not good. And I, I love the can do spirit of the Taiwan civic tech community and those in government who are saying we have to work with this. But what is it that, as you see this evolve, what's your biggest worry about how it's, it's proceeding? Mm -hmm. Katie, do you want to start? Biggest worry. Yeah. Um, I think for uh, for myself, um, looking at um, the extent of disinformation that we receive um, every day, um, every government agencies, um, every um, organizations and entities, we have been bombarded by disinformation. Um, it takes. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, work hours um, for individuals. So I know that um, the civic tech communities is working really hard to catch up with uh, how to combat uh, disinformation. Um, and I want to um, echo uh, Minister Tang's um, words in the beginning that we need to be able to combat disinformation, but at the same time protect our uh, journalist integrities and our rights to free speech, um, the values that we share as democracies. So, um, so I, I would not just say that this is my worry, but I think this is a challenge that we have to face um, dealing, you know, living in the digital world that we live in right now. Mm, that's, that's excellent. So um, this is part of the, the slide that I shared both in NDI and NSIS. Uh, 
So uh, talking about this information, and back at that time, one year ago, uh, I used this as a metaphor, and now, now it doesn't seem like a metaphor anymore. Uh, we're literally focusing on, on the sustainable development goals uh, as the entire world. But the same ideas still apply. If we over-concentrate on um, the quarantining, uh, the social distancing uh, of uh, not only countering coronavirus, but also metaphorically about making sure that the social media platforms um, built in a lot of protective measures that may actually over-focus our energy on these things that may also have a negative, um, and I'm not uh, talking only about infringing our media freedom and so on that you have already so eloquently put, but also just like the term social distancing itself, it puts a distance between people. But around the time of coronavirus, we do need the social support that we can get from people over um, Google Hangout Meet or things like that. And so instead of saying, you know, distancing uh, socially or distancing from uh, sharing on social media, distancing, think twice before you share, which are all very good suggestions. I think it's even more important to achieve a universal health coverage, both in the sense of Taiwan's NHI single payer system, but also in the sense of the communicable information like the cute dog um, that everybody loves uh, and can share and make sure <laughs> that they get, uh, they travel faster um, than the rumors, than the disinformation, to make sure that this kind of clarifications and public announcement travels half the world uh, before the rumor can even catch up flipping uh, the coin uh, on, on this regard. And I would worry uh, if people start over-focusing on the prevention and especially penalizing the criminalization of this part of the things and neglecting the vast importance of the first two steps, which is achieving the universal mental health coverage, as well as supporting the research and development of more pro-social uh, media platforms so that all social media become more pro-social instead of anti-social media. I would worry if people start painting everything as a us versus them, black versus white, disinformation versus the good people. All right, thank you. Stephen, any thoughts, final thoughts? Yes, but quickly, because I think we're running out of time very quickly. I, I, at the beginning of, of, of the program, I said that there are two components to disinformation. One is technological and the second is sociological. Uh, let me be, tap into the first one first. Technologically, I'm concerned about evolving auto sources of automation and the ability to more easily create synthetic content. I'm thinking about something called GANs, generated web serial networks that can create images of people right down to their pores, but the people don't exist. The other is, is face swapping technology and also audio technology that allows for the mass, almost the mass production of synthetic content. When that sort of stuff is flooding an information environment, it makes it all that much harder for people to sort out what is what is real and what is not. So as that technology develops, that's causing concern. Uh, at the sociological political level, uh, you know, the world is in the midst of this drift towards authoritarianism. And authoritarian regimes are not interested in truth. They're interested in preserving their own privilege. Uh, and we need to do something about that trend. And that's a really large question, but it's a really important one. So in a larger context, I think disinformation needs to be addressed by addressing the fundamentals of democratic government. Well, you're speaking our language, Stephen. That's what NDI does um, <clears throat> worldwide. And look, I want to thank all three of you we have, excuse me, we have gone about five minutes over time. I think it's worthwhile. This is an extremely important topic, extremely important to spotlight what Taiwan is doing and to share the successes, not just of Taiwan, but everyone around the world who is who are fighting uh, for democracy, fighting for the truth, fighting for facts, and need to be collectively working together across boundaries to deal with this, uh, because it is something that's not simply national. It is international. And we have people like Minister Audrey Tang, Dr. Ketty Chen, Professor Stephen Livingston. I think we're, this is the foundation for that pushback and for supporting democratic development worldwide. So I want to thank all three of you for your help. I want to say again, for those still listening, uh, patch on to ndi.org to watch the documentary, 12-minute documentary that we produced about the Taiwan civic tech community uh, surrounding the January 2020 elections. 
think it's very, very interesting. Share it with friends, share it on Twitter, share it on Facebook. Um, and I just want to thank everybody for their, your contributions to this conversation. Thank you all very much. And you all have be safe, be well. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank for you. Having me.